Welcome to Through the Bible. Today our journey in God's Word takes us to the city of Philippi as we begin our study of the New Testament book, 2 Corinthians. Our teacher is Dr. J. Vernon McGee, and I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, encouraging you to grab your copy of God's Word and hop aboard the Bible bus. Now, in just a few minutes, Dr. McGee is going to mention his notes and outlines for 2 Corinthians. So if you already have your free copy, then go ahead and grab them too. Now, just recently, we released a new resource called Briefing the Bible. It's a compilation of all of Dr. McGee's notes and outlines, and you can download each book individually or the whole Bible. Just visit ttb.org forward slash briefing the Bible to download the digital version or request an abridged copy by mail. I'd also like to suggest that you visit ttb.org and download our handy bookmark that outlines our daily Bible readings for this series. There's no better way to prepare our hearts and minds for the study than to read through the passages before we begin. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we study your word, please fill our lives with your love, grace, mercy, and comfort today, just as we'll learn about in today's study. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we come today to this second epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. Now, some time ago, we went through the first epistle. And that epistle was a very important one, as we made it very clear at that time, that it dealt actually with the church. If we didn't have that epistle, actually, we'd not know very much about church government. We'd not know very much about how the church is to conduct itself in the world. But now we come to the second epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. And I want to say some things by way of introduction today. First of all, let me confess very frankly that I do not feel up to it for this epistle. I said that same thing in Romans. But I say it in second Corinthians here. I find myself in this epistle dealing with things that Only the Spirit of God can make real to us. And I have spent more time in preparation to give this series on the radio than any book of the Bible that we've come to so far in the five-year program. I have not only spent more time with this epistle, studying it afresh and anew, but the more I studied, the less I found out I knew about this epistle. And I wondered why I had not preached on it more. And I wondered why there were not more sermons on this epistle. Oh, I preached on it some, but it hasn't been given by the church the attention that it should have. Now, what we have in this epistle is, to my judgment, that which is rather difficult. I want to give you a statement that I have in our notes and outlines of this Epistle, and I trust that you do have the notes and outlines for 2 Corinthians. And this is the statement that we want to make. Paul wrote 2 Corinthians shortly after he wrote 1 Corinthians. He had written 1 Corinthians from Ephesus, and he was engaged in a great ministry there, as he says, a great door. And effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. Well, Paul had, I believe, his greatest ministry in Asia Minor, Ephesus being the springboard and the sounding board for the gospel. And I believe that probably the gospel covered that area in a more effective manner than it ever has in any other place at any other time. And that's what Paul meant, a great door, and a factual is opened unto me. Now, because of that, he couldn't leave that ministry and go over to Corinth, where that baby church he'd started over there, filled with carnal Christians, carnal Corinthians, babes in Christ, 
They wanted Paul to come. They wanted attention. They wanted food. And they wanted a change, too, of garments. They were all wet, if you please. And they were crying like a baby would cry. And Paul couldn't come. And they were a little miffed and hurt by it. And so Paul wrote that first letter and told them that he would be coming later. He didn't come later. And they were still disturbed. And Titus came back and brought him word. And Paul, by that time, had left Ephesus proper. He'd gone on up to Troas. Well, let me read 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11. He says here, verse 12, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Now, when he went over to Macedonia, that is, to Philippi, why Titus, whom he had sent to Corinth in his place came and brought him word about the answers to some of the things that Paul had told them to do. Were they doing them? And therefore, Paul sat down and wrote this second epistle. And this is the one that we have here. Now, they were still myth. They wanted the great apostle to come and be with him. And here is where Paul actually opens his heart in a very wonderful way. To tell the truth, we find Paul here just letting us probably come to know him better personally than in any other place. Now, I want to continue to read to you what I put in my notes. I got away from it there for a moment. And the news, by the way, though, that Titus brought was good news. And any breach that had been between Paul and the Corinthian church was healed. Now, I'm reading. This epistle is difficult to outline, as it is less organized than any of Paul's letters, but it contains more personal details. In each chapter, there's always a minor theme developed, which sometimes seems to take the place of the major theme and is generally expressed in some striking verse. This may explain the seeming difficulty in outlining and organizing this epistle. We'll note this as we consider each chapter. Now, I want to just give briefly to you the outline that we have of this epistle, because I think that's very important for us to see. In the first seven chapters, we have the comfort of God. And this is one of the most important for you and me, for it has to do with Christian living right where you and I are located today. Then wedged in this epistle are two chapters that seem extraneous, but they're not. And having talked about the comfort of God, he talks about the collection for the poor saints at Jerusalem. And the minute you mention a collection... Well, that's not a comfort to a lot of the saints. And here you do not have Christian living, but Christian giving. And then in chapters 10 through 13, believe me, Paul becomes very personal, and you have the calling of the apostle Paul. And here is Christian guarding, Christian living, Christian giving, Christian guarding. Now, this is very important. In the first two verses... We have an introduction. And then, well, the rest of chapter 1, we have God's comfort for life's plans. Now, let's look at this, friends, for, as I said, I feel like it's difficult to rise to the high level of this epistle. And he begins on a high note. Will you listen to him? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, By the will of God. Now, Paul, writing in the authority of an apostle, is writing with all that authority. And my friends, if a man today in the ministry can speak with authority, he ought to get out of the ministry and start selling insurance or selling gas at a filling station because there's no use 
trying to give out God's Word unless you're convinced of it yourself. And that's the weakness of the church today is there are too many men. They're not sure. The early church, when the persecution began, the first thing you remember, they said, O Lord, thou art God. My friend, if you're not sure he's God, then you're not sure anything. And then they were sure of the word of God. They rested upon it at all times. So Paul, with this authority, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and will you notice this? By the will of God. My friend, you don't go any higher than the will of God. (laughs) You can't go any higher than that. And that, my friend, is authority. If what you are doing is by the will of God, my friend, there's no question in your mind. If you are today in the will of God, I don't care where you are, how you are, and what your circumstances are. If you are in the will of God, my friend, you are in a glorious, wonderful place today. And you may even be in the best hospital there is in town. <laughs> but may I say to you, that is the proper place. I have a friend, he's a music director, and... He generally begins a song service on some humorous note. And I heard him say one time, he said, Now, wouldn't you rather be here than even the best hospital in town? Well, I've always laughed at that, but I've thought about it a great deal. If it's God's will for you to be in the best hospital in town, you know that's going to be the greatest place for you, my friend, if that's God's will for you. Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. And then this is lovely here. And Timothy, our brother. He's your Christian brother. He's my Christian brother. Now, Paul also, when he writes to Timothy, calls him, you're my son in the faith. But when he's writing to the church, he puts Timothy right on a par with himself. And I love that way Paul has of bringing these different ones on the same plane with himself. And he says here, under the church of God. This is God's church we're talking about. I hear people say my church today. And I think that a lot of these folk that call it my church, they act like that sometimes in the church. They forget it's God's church and that it is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he purchased with his blood. And in view of the fact he paid such a price, you and I better not be cheap Christians expressing our little will in the church. And that's just about what some are saying today in the church. Cheap, 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 cheap. Well, I want to tell you, my friend, it's under the church of God. Now, it happens to be here at Corinth, and it could be in your hometown or your neighborhood. The church of God which is at Corinth with all the saints which are in all Achaia. And Paul didn't confine it to just Corinth. Paul extends it now to all Achaia because everywhere the gospel went in that day, these folk were witnesses. They carried it out to others. And I've gone through that land of Achaia. Beautiful country. Lovely country. Most beautiful great vineyards there I've ever seen anywhere. And flowers, how beautiful they are. And I can see those early Christians steeped in sin in Corinth at one time. Paul came and the scales fell from their eyes. Light broke on their darkened souls. They turned to Christ from their sins. And then they're going out all over Achaia, witnesses for Christ. Many were one to Christ. Paul's talking to them, to all the saints which are in all Achaia. How wonderful. Notice, grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's this formal, almost stereotype greeting, and I've dealt with that in other epistles, and I'll not deal with it here, but just pass by to get to verse 3. But because I pass by, it doesn't mean it's not on the same lofty plane that verse 1 was. And all of this is on the same plane. When we come to verse 3, will you listen to this? We're past now the introduction. Now we have God's comfort for life's plan. Wonderful to be in the will of God, friends. 
I would say that's the biggest business you could be in today. Now, you may run for an office and be elected. And if that's not God's will for you, God help you. You may be president of the biggest company in the world. I guess that would be General Motors, some other company. But if it's not God's will, that would be the worst place in the world for you to be. It would be better that you were the janitor in the place. May I say to you, to be in the will of God, how wonderful that is. Now, notice, having spoken of that, he can say, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Oh, this is a rich verse now that we've come to here. Will you notice? Blessed be God. Now, the word here for blessed actually is praise. Praise be to God. I wonder how much we really praise Him. I found out that I'm doing a better job of praising Him since I retired than I did when I was pastor. And we ought to remember that Well, David put it like this. David says, I'll bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That ought to get rid of the complaining, friends, of a lot of saints. Psalm 34, 1, that is. I'll bless the Lord at all times. How wonderful it is. And we are told today that we are to praise the Lord, whoso Offereth praise, glorifieth me. How wonderful this is. Now, Paul here goes on to say, Blessed be God. He's the Father. That is, that's his position in the Trinity. And God so loved the world, he gave him his only begotten Son. Now, it wasn't that he was begotten in the sense of being born. That's not the thought at all. He's the only begotten in the sense that he occupies a position that's unique. He is the eternal son, and he's the everlasting father. Now, if you have a father and a son like that, there never was a time when there was any begetting in the sense of being born. And it's his position in the Trinity. And God gave the son. Blessed be God. Praise be to God. Even the Father who gave the Lord Jesus Christ for us, and now he's called the Father of mercy. Now, I want to spend a moment here on three words, and not too much time, but just a little. One is love, one is mercy, one is grace. I've mentioned this before. So much has been said about love, and it becomes rather sloppy when I hear it spoken of that God's saving people by love. Now, God loves you. Oh, he loves you. <laughs> you just don't know how much he loves you. It would break your heart and my heart today if we knew how much God loves us. But it doesn't save us by love. The Scripture says, by grace are ye saved. Now, what is grace? Well, that means we call it unmerited favor. It means God saves you on a different basis than merit. He saves you. Yes, he loves you, but doesn't save you by love. He saves you by grace. Why? Because he's also the God of all mercies. He's the Father of mercy. Now, what's mercy? Well, mercy means that God so loved you that he provided a Savior for you. Because he couldn't save you any other way. And anything that you have today is a mercy from God. He's the father of mercy. And he's said to be rich in grace and rich in mercy. Now, do you need any mercy today? Well, if you need any money, you generally go to the bank. If you need mercy, go to the one that's the father of it. He's the father, we are told down here, of all mercies. He's the God of all comfort. You need any help today? Go to him. He's the one. And Anything that you have today is a mercy from God. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve anything that I've got and don't have too much. But what I got is a mercy from God. You know, he was merciful when he put me in the ministry even because you don't know me like I know myself. Now, if you knew me like I know myself, you'd turn the radio off. But wait a minute, don't turn it off. If I knew you like you know yourself, 
I wouldn't be talking to you, you see. I just quit right now. But you see, we today have been extended mercy. And I'm in a ministry. I'm on the radio because of the mercy of God. And I hate to say this, but I have to say it. You know, I had cancer and still have it in my lungs. And you know what that is? Mercy of God. <laughs> oh, my. That's hard for me to say that. But anything that you have from God, we're going to see it in this book, that anything is a mercy. The first seven chapters here, we have all about mercy, the comfort of God. And we have it in life's plans here. And how wonderful it is. He's the Father of mercies, and He's the God of all comfort. Now, let's test this in the crucible of life. How about the acid of suffering we mentioned a while ago? He's the God of all comfort. He can comfort you in the hospital. He can comfort you at the funeral home when you've got a loved one there. He can comfort you any place, friends, at any time. He is the God of all comfort. Now, there is an authentic comfort and there is a counterfeit one. I don't like people to say, oh, yes, God's permitted this to come to me and I accept it. But they don't accept it. Oh, boy, how they rebel. Tell him, be honest with God. If you don't like it, tell him you don't like it. He wants you to, and he already knows about it anyway. And comfort can be genuine or fake. Now, the popular notion of the meaning of comfort, that it is sort of a note of weakness and sentimentality. It has with it saccharine and old lace. You know, some dear, wonderful Christian woman, mother coming and comforting you. That has its place. I don't mean it. But that's not what he's talking about here. I'll tell you that. I know that when I was a little fella, I'd fall down. I was always skinning my knees. My mother, I always wondered why she didn't put me in long pants, but she never did. And I was always skinning my knees. And she kissed it. <laughs> she says, it's well now. And you know, she kidded me about that. I thought it was. I quit crying. May I say to you, that sentiment, that's sweet, that's lovely. But you know, there came a day when I went away to school. I got discouraged and I didn't have any money. <laughs> then she talked to me. That was comfort too. It's pretty strong man. She says, you won't be a man now, son. You must be a man. That was comfort. May I say to you that I think some people think of comfort being like I saw an advertisement on a billboard advertising whiskey, and it said Southern Comfort. Well, I'm a Southerner, but I never felt that was any comfort. They'll ruin a home, my friend. LSD. Some people think that's a comfort, but it's not. Now, what does he mean by comfort? Well, the verb is parakaleo. That means call to the side. Now, the Holy Spirit is called a paraclete. That is, he's called to the side of. And the Lord Jesus said, I'll not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you. And the word there is orphanoi. We get our word orphans from that. He says, I won't leave you orphans. I'm going to send the comforter, the paraclete to you. And he says, it's best for you that I go away. If I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I go, I'll send him unto you. Now, what is the comforter then? Will you hear me? It's not one that kisses the bruise. No, that could be part. But it's a helper, a strengthener, an advocate, one who's called to help me and to strengthen me and relieve the loneliness and assuage the grief and calm the fears. And it means help in time of terrifying trouble, if you please. Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be thou my helper. That's the cry of a soul that needs a comforter. And he's the God of all comfort. Say, I hate to stop right there, but we're going to pick right up there next time. What a great study. I hope that you're as excited as I am to meet back here on Monday for our continuing study of Second Corinthians. If you know someone, maybe in a difficult place, who needs God's comfort, you can share this important message with them by directing them to our website, ttb.org. 
And while you're at it, invite them to join for the rest of our study. In the days to come, we'll learn more about the amazing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You can also invite them to join you for more of Dr. McGee's great teaching in 2 Corinthians on this week's Sunday sermon titled, The God of All Comfort. To listen online or to see if your station carries the Sunday sermon, visit ttb.org. Remember, ttb.org is also the place to visit if you'd like to download any of Dr. McGee's free booklets like Gifts of the Spirit, or if you'd like to purchase the entire five-year series of messages available on a convenient flash drive or on our Solar Bible bus. To find out more about these great resources, go to ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. As we go, I pray that you're filled with God's great grace, mercy, and love as you walk with Him today. I'm Steve Schwetz. And I'll meet you here on Monday. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.